ladies and gentlemen, judges, audience members. I'm Ian Ramsdell. I'm an undergrad here at UMass Lowell. I am, uh, more, more importantly, I'm a veteran of the armed forces. I served for 15 years before I was uh, medically retired from the military. I was medically retired because of uh, all the issues that I have accumulated physically and mentally through my years of service. And uh, unfortunately, they started hindering me. The more, uh, uh, the little bit older I got, the more I moved forward. So I'm also a uh, uh, business major. I study finance and entrepreneurship. And I'm also a professional life man maker, and I also run a nonprofit for wounded and injured veterans. Um, I'm Dan Bullahan. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, Ian and I met uh, through a veteran school guide program. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about some of the background of the things that I've been researching in my past two years at Tufts University. Understand some of the context that we're dealing with here as well, uh, and to also put some context in the story. So, about half of the 2.7 million troops that have been deployed since 2001 have experienced difficulty reintegrating into society. Um, and what we know uh, is that this cohort tends to avoid all traditional supports, so everything from the VA and the health care uh, to even the more community based things like uh, VFWs. What we also know from the literature is that uh, things that meet the interests and needs of veterans, leisure activities in particular, can be a particularly powerful platform to bring individuals together, to give them uh, things to look forward to, to give them uh, means of personal growth, but also to create social uh, and, and, and personal connections. One particular option, the way that Ian and I originally met, was in school diving, which is a very unique place conducted in space. And what we know from the experiences of divers is uh, the unique uh, state of mind that it can create for you, uh, the kind of the respite from the typical kind of the built world uh, and the, the typical thoughts you have to put with reality. This increased intention and appreciation of the environment around you and also uh, uh, the sense of connection with others that certainly becomes important during a dive, that reliance upon others but also afterwards. So there's a sense of improved social connection that occurs through this engagement. Um, so there's a couple of problems that you have to deal with uh, in scuba diving. Uh, scuba diving does not start at the edge of the boat in gear. Um, scuba diving starts lugging gear. This is less than a third of the gear that you would use to get to the water, particularly around. Thank you. Sorry, stage. Uh, <laughs> So, scuba diving typically starts atop of those rocks. Scuba diving starts at the top of a ladder or a platform or a plank you have to walk down and get to the boat. And so for individuals who put some mileage on and uh, have worn knees out or are in love with disability, accessing that place I was just describing to you, social connection, peace and respite, and even a sense of adventure which kind of paradoxical off those states, that becomes a barrier, one of the many to getting uh, to that place. So as a researcher, a dive instructor, a therapist, I've spoken at length with dozens of people who, uh, uh, who describe that these difficult conditions of accessing the water, in addition to that, all the other things we have in our lives, that's just one more barrier to get out the water. I remember the first time we sat there a couple years ago going, I wish there was an easier way to get all this gear in the water because I'm going to be here tomorrow. Um, and so uh, it's consistent with market research uh, that this gear is, uh, imagine this heavy gear getting into the train is really one of the most major things that keeps people from dying, including the troops uh, who would otherwise engage in it, but also the three million scuba divers in the United States who would otherwise be trying to access it in uh, these uh, situations. So there's a lot of market, there's a tremendous amount of turnover and dropout in, in the uh, sport. So we've come up with an idea that essentially solves the problem by going over the barriers. And we've been working on several variations of it. Remarkably, there are no competing products on the market. If you saw that rocky ledge that you're trying to get the gear over, this will not work. It doesn't work particularly well on stairs. It certainly doesn't work on the beach. So um, uh, we also, this, this, the Odysseys, the over-terrain deployed scuba entry egress system, um, uh, would also uh, have uses outside the primary market for transferring gear, supplies, and even people that some models all over different parts of and getting people into the places they want to be and things uh, to where want to uh, Introduce the Odyssey. The Odyssey started off with an example of 
how are we going to be able to make ourselves less sore the next day when we have to lug this gear over uneven terrain and slippery terrain to access and do an activity that we are very passionate about. It initially started out with me developing a prototype because I got my hands on a welder and I built this large contraption that would attach to the back of my truck. You can see it in the lower left right there. This will utilize a zip line technology from that point, which would be at, parked at a staging area, and then it would then go all the way down to the, to the entrance at the water, or even on some dive sites that have more buoys there, we could actually at, uh, connect this connection directly in the water, allowing divers or even disabled divers to leave a staging area with their equipment, zip line it directly down into the water, and, and uh, then access the water itself. We uh, currently have a second model that we're uh, developing, which is a lightweight version, which is a zip line, zip line that actually has a uh, webbing that you can attach to fixed objects out on the site. And we're just recently developed that, and we're pushing that forward a little bit more to see if there's a market for that one specifically. Um, our resources currently, we uh, have a lot of collaboration with other divers, dive organizations, including veteran nonprofits that are local that we're both part of, and the dive community, which is very vocal, uh, part of a membership of the dive Facebook group that has well over 40,000 members. So we have the access to this market to either uh, ask questions, see if there is a market for these objects, and then utilize that information to either adapt, overcome, and then actually figure out a way to bring access to these individuals. Uh, the funding will be used is mainly just for testing and uh, make sure that this device is as safe as possible for our gear and the people that are going in the water because this one device right here, this purple tank, if it falls off a height and gets this top valve knocked up, it turns into a projectile hazard and can cause a lot of harm. So that's one of the things we're also trying to alleviate by utilizing this device. Should we have time? Could we move to the Q&A? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two different options that we're that we're put into development. One is utilizing a winch, an electric winch. But right now, the problem with the electric winch on the market is a lot of them move very slow. So it depends on the incline and the amount of forces being pulled. We could end up having a, a return or recovery of a diver or equipment that could last well over five minutes just to get it 200 feet back to the vehicle. The other way we're looking at is a pulley system that would uh, be run as a runner underneath the zipline system and attach the carriage, where it, would, it could physically be pulled up the, the, slow, the less steep inclines. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes, sir. How would that work on the beach? Let's say the truck is only so high. What's your other point? Uh, so that would be the, the starting point, the fixed point. I actually developed a six-foot auger for sandy beaches that we had, we had to wait until the weather got better to bring out the test. So we're going to test that initially, otherwise it's going to be some type of anchor point, whether it's in an actual sea anchor that we're able to put in, in, in the soft sand and, and bed and see how much force that can take on it. Um, or most of these places do end up having large rock outcroppings in it, Adam that we can utilize just, uh, you know, put a strap and a U-bolt attached to it, make sure it's well secure, and then attach the zip line directly to that. Does that type of, uh, I'm just having trouble picturing those types of, so how much clearance you're gonna have. So if you, you talk about want, not wanting to damage your back, not at that, at the other end. Okay, if you, at, I understand if you use the auger, but if you're securing it to a rock or, or or basically a buoy that's in the water. Yes. That doesn't seem very stable to me and, and potentially creates a risk with regards to that heavy equipment. Yes, you're exactly correct, sir. It does create a risk. So the mo mooring lines that they actually have there, they have what's uh, called mooring rock attached to it. Normally, it's a it's over, it's over two tons worth of concrete in a circle that they attach a chain to, and that attaches to a, a buoy at the surface. So. It's highly unlikely that we'd end up ever moving one of the mooring lines. The rocks, on the other hand, if you... Sorry, uh, you see those pictures, the top two? That's a common dive site we dive here in New England. It's called Cathedral Rock. They're boulders, they're ginormous. So we have these fixed access points uh, at those types of sites. 
Uh, for the, like you said, soft sand beach, we're going to experiment with augers and anchors. We haven't been able to uh, get that far with the technology yet. Uh, it's mainly uh, cost limiting right now. It's, there's only so much money both of us can put out of our pocket. It's working in dollars with families. Right? <coughs> yes. Have you done any um, testing with your We want to have something like that because we've got trace that we've been there. Yeah. Uh, wrapping around a tree, wrapping around fixed rock structures, and around around live structures, not around things in the water. So the kind of those water is that we have. Have you coordinated all the patterns that we have? We've not reached out to patterns that are more training as opposed to uh, product development. Um, so really we're relying upon friends that. Uh, colleagues uh, from the climbing community and so forth else to kind of figure out what is going to be the technology that we need to use to solve this. It seems to be a relatively simple problem. The difficulty is that the trains of receipt uh, be a beach or would be lacking a receiving site that we can uh, secure to. And that's what we're trying to figure out is what tool we need to receive. It's really stuff from only two fixed points though. Can you remind me of the cost the, the, the cost of the Okay, so uh, unfortunately, we got a little talking, it's a bad habit, we the age, we all know that. Um, so right now, uh, this is our target demographic. The average scuba diver is between 38 and 53 years old, and they're white collar, they make over seventy-five dollars to $100,000, and they are used to paying larger amounts of money, $500 plus for a piece of equipment that will make their life better. That not just uh, for life saving, like needing air underwater, but also for convenience as well. Um, our cost structure right now is estimate because it was, uh, I bootleg built this thing in my garage. It cost me roughly $208 to build it at this point. And we actually have a pre order from uh, one of these veteran dive organizations we know of the area. And the price point right now is $999. It's, dude, we haven't done enough research into the market to see what the actual price was. So that's very, very nonsense. It's more of a scale, yes. Yeah.